how to get better at chess. 109 million results in 0.6 seconds. How to build a faster search engine. It's really kind of amazing when you think of the fact that we can basically type in natural human language into a search bar and almost instantly, in a negligible amount of time, find the information that we're looking for. Sometimes that might be doing a product search on some e-commerce website, it might be looking for a Wikipedia article for some topic that we're interested in, or it might be some location on a map that we can instantly zoom into and find just by typing a simple query into a search bar. I think search is an incredibly fascinating topic and one of the things that I find kind of interesting about it is it is still kind of a niche topic in computer science even though it essentially rules the way that we use the internet. So in this series I want to take a look at how search engines work from the ground up starting with sort of the fundamental concepts, the fundamental data structures and algorithms that are involved in building search and we're actually going to build a search engine from scratch, a simple search engine, using .NET. Um, so we'll be writing a lot of C-sharp in this series in order to better understand really, again, the fundamentals of search engines and doing text search in particular. I'd also highly recommend this book on information retrieval. My copy is kind of beat up, um, but this really is a fantastic book on search and actually there's a PDF that is freely available over at the Stanford NLP website, so I'll put a link to that in the description. Search is a lot of fun, so if you've never actually sort of dug into how search engines are built and work, then I think this is gonna be a great opportunity for you to dig in and build a search engine of your own. Now, if you're watching this, you're probably already aware of the fact that there are a lot of open source search engines out there, things like Elasticsearch and Solar, uh, both of which are built on Lucene. And so there's a lot of existing technology out there that will also be um, a really great resource to learn again because all of this is open source um, so if you're interested into diving into more complex projects after we work through this series um, then there's no shortage of uh, code open source code that you can browse and learn more so with that let's go ahead and get started and let's talk about some of the most basic concepts when it comes to search Okay, so really quickly before we get started, I'm just gonna talk about some of the various dependencies that I'll be using throughout this series in the event that you want to actually code along. All of the code that we'll be looking at and all the documentation is going to be available over at GitHub and we'll take a look at that momentarily. But the two main uh, tools I'll be using here will be Jupyter Notebook, we will be looking at some simple examples in Python as we build out or as we explore some of the fundamental concepts rather. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to demonstrate them uh, in a tool like Jupyter Notebook with Python. Um, and so if you'd like to install that or use it to open any of the notebooks that I'll be working on in this series, then just head over to jupyter.org slash install. And I won't be using Jupyter Lab, but you could of course install that. I'll just be using the classic Jupyter Notebook. So you can typically use Conda or Pip to get that installed. And then in terms of .NET, I'll be writing C Sharp using the .NET runtime. And so for this, just head over and get .NET Core for whatever operating system you're using. And then if you would like to just follow along with the code itself or clone it, then you can head over to my GitHub here at github.com slash westoil slash javelin.net. And you should be able to find all the code there. I'll have separate directories in this uh, in this repository for the various notebooks as well as the source code that we'll be building throughout this series as we actually build the search engine and i do intend for this to be kind of a long-term project that i add to and occasionally make videos for and add to this series so just follow along as everything gets updated i'll be pushing all the changes for this uh, into this repository and it will remain open source and then finally, I would like to mention and give a huge shout out to this book, Introduction to Information Retrieval by Manning, Raghavan, and Schütze. 
This uh, book is a fantastic resource for learning about search and uh, in fact it goes into great detail about specific use cases for search, uh, web crawling and really search at huge scales, uh, talking about uh, some very complex models for building uh, IR systems and um, yeah this, this is just a fantastic read super fascinating and really covers everything from the very basics to some of the most complex types of uh, search engines that are built um, and so a lot of the information that I know about search and that I've learned has come from this textbook um, and so I figured I'd give a shout out to it here because it's available online and is a fantastic resource so there'll be a link to this in the description so I want to start out here by covering what this topic really means, this idea information retrieval or search. So for this, I'm going to turn to that book, Introduction to Information Retrieval, because I think the authors give a really fantastic definition, and it contains a few key concepts that we'll return to as we build our search engine together. So information retrieval is finding material, usually documents, of an unstructured nature, usually text, that satisfies an information need from within large collections, usually stored on computers. Okay, so there are a few really important concepts to unpack here. The first one is this idea of unstructured data. So when we talk about unstructured data, as the definition suggests here, we're typically talking about text or raw text data. So what makes raw text unstructured? Well, if you think about it, we can't anticipate anything about the shape or the contents of raw text. It really takes no particular structure at all. So raw text can contain any type of character encodings. It can be an, of an arbitrary length. It might be just some raw long string of characters that would be meaningless from a natural language perspective, or it might be the complete works of Shakespeare. It can really take any form and we we can't predict ahead of time what it's going to look like in terms of shape. If we think about the other end of the spectrum, structured data, here we're talking about things like SQL databases. So here we're really talking about tabular data. Uh, data in a SQL relational database needs to uh, conform to a very particular interface or schema in order for it to be stored in a particular table. So we can't put arbitrary values, we can't uh, mix and match column names and column types on a per record basis. All of the records in a particular relational database in a particular table will have the same shape and we can make uh, assertions and predictions about the general shape that the data that comes out of that a particular source will take. And of course we interact with it using formal languages like SQL. Now there is a sort of in-between here called semi-structured data. And when we talk about semi-structured data, think sort of object notation like JSON or uh, XML or other sort of tree-like structures, um, even CSV files. So here we have some of the benefits of structured data in the sense that we can build tools that parse uh, parse information that takes the form of JSON, XML, or CSV, but we're still in general going to have a lot of flexibility here, a lot of chance for errors to be introduced in terms of the structure of particular records. And so while we have some of the flexibility of raw text and that we don't have such a rigid uh, situation as we would in a fully relational SQL database, we still have some structure to our data. So here think like HTML pages or some CSV files, we could still have corrupt records. You know, we might have a million good records and then one CSV record with an extra comma in it or something, and uh, then we have some data cleaning that we would need to do. So for our purposes, we are at the far end of the unstructured data side of things, and we'll be dealing with raw text. Now you may also be thinking, just as a quick side note here, that certain types of raw text, like natural language, does have some structure, perhaps, in the sense that it might have a syntactic or a semantic structure, and that's true, and we'll actually take advantage of those particular sort of metastructures of the text in some more, of the, some more of the advanced features of our search engine, but that really says nothing about the overall shape and structure of the information itself on like a per document basis. Okay, so next 
uh, a really important concept and probably one of the most interesting here is this idea of an information need. So the information retrieval systems we'll be building will need to satisfy some type of information need. And all an information need is at a very high level is really just a user's desire to find some particular information from a system in order to satisfy a particular need. And one of the reasons that this is so interesting and so important is because it's really going to influence sort of the type of search engine that we build and the particular purpose for the search engine that we're building. So we get kind of spoiled, let's say, by search engines like Google in that we can essentially type in any sort of ad hoc natural language query and the results we get back are tailored specifically to the type of query that we provide. But we often don't think about how variant those types of queries and those particular types of information needs that drive those queries are. So let's think about a couple of examples here. First, let's imagine that we are an amateur chef and we want to know how to make croissants. So think about what we're trying to get out of uh, this particular information need that we have. We could structure this, we could structure a particular query any number of ways, but really we have some underlying need, which is that we want to be able to bake croissants. And there's a lot that's sort of implicit in this. We want them to be, uh, we want them to turn out well, for instance. And so the types of things that we might expect to get back from an information retrieval system in this case might be like a recipe for croissants. Maybe we want it to, we want to ensure that it's high quality, sort of implicitly again. And we're probably looking for one result, let's say. I mean, maybe we're trying to build a collection of all of the croissant recipes we can find. But in general, if we have the need to make croissants, we really just want one good result. We want one good recipe from the information retrieval system that we are working with. Now let's think about a different type of information need. Let's imagine that we have an overdue library book and the library closes in half an hour and we are on our bike and we need to find the quickest route to the library so that we don't get fined. So our information need here is the quickest route, maybe by bike, to the library. So here we have a completely sort of different class of an information need, I'll say. Um, it's similar in some ways in that we're probably looking for one result. You know, we want the quickest route, but we want the route to be correct. We want the correct library. We want the correct location that we're starting from, and we want, uh, we want it to be the fastest route. And of course, there may be a lot of information that goes into determining what makes something the fastest route, for instance. So here our information need is finding a sort of geographic route from one location to another to satisfy that underlying need uh, for us to return a book to a particular location. So there are a few other types of information needs that we have which are completely different in nature. So let's say that my information need is that I want to know uh, what my friends did last weekend. So here I'm probably looking for many results. I'm sort of more interested in browsing. I want to make sure that they're relevant to my social network, whatever that means. And here maybe I'm trying to satisfy something like entertainment or some type of social connection. But I'm not really looking for one particular result. I'm really sort of just interested in browsing. There are other types of information needs that uh, might lead to sort of browsing behavior. Like let's say that I'm just uh, shopping for bikes, but I don't know exactly what bike I want. And so I might just want to be browsing bikes within a particular range of results. So this is another one. So maybe I'm in the market for finding a mountain bike, but I don't know exactly which one. Maybe I don't know much about mountain bikes, so I'm probably looking for many results, maybe within a particular price range. Maybe I'm interested in a few different brands, and this would lead us to different types of maybe faceted search to satisfy this type of information need, which is a concept that we'll talk about a bit later. And then finally, I want to mention one other type of interesting information need. Let's say that I'm just curious and I want to know something uh, sort of esoteric, like how does DNA replicate? 
So here I may be looking for many results so that I can sort of synthesize multiple sources of information. But the other interesting thing that I might do is I might come across some terms that I don't know. Like, let's say I don't know really what an enzyme is, and I come across this in my search about how does DNA replicate. And here I may do a subsequent search and I have this sort of iterative or almost recursive type of search where I'm sort of drilling in and in a way I am just iterating on searches for other topics all as a all as a sort of underlying need to synthesize some complex information in order to improve my understanding of a subject. So here we have just a few different types of information needs and what I've put in quotes here might be a query, but notice that the query isn't really the same thing as the information need. The information need in each of these cases is uh, that higher level sort of abstract idea of the information that's required for me to satisfy some particular need. And so as the designers of search engines, we'll have to think about how we can interpret natural language queries in order to really understand what the information need is of a particular user so that we can provide them with what they're looking for. And so ideas about relevance come into play here, ideas about what the actual structure of the result look like and there's just so much to unpack here so we're kind of spoiled by search engines like Google where I'm sure that you've made certain types of uh, queries that relate to all of these different types of information needs without even realizing maybe how different they are and how quickly you in the case of Google you get results back that are relevant for your particular search so this is the idea of information needs and I just wanted to talk about that very briefly. And so finally, the last idea I want to talk about in this definition is large collections. So when we're talking about building a search engine, we're generally talking about working with a lot of data. If we didn't have a lot of data, we wouldn't need a search engine, right? If you had one document, you could just read it and extract all the information for yourself. Um, if we had even like a thousand or a few thousand documents of a relatively small size on our computer, we could even just linear search through them using something like grep or um, just using making use of regular expressions like we can with grep, of course. And we could just linearly scan through the text and find what we're looking for. But when we're talking about a lot of data very quickly, that becomes really impractical. So if we think about things at web scale, then we're talking about just a mind boggling amount of data that uh, we need to extract information from. And while we won't be working at web scale in this particular series, we will be talking about the different types of data structures that we will need uh, for us to actually build a scalable solution so that we can deal with gigabytes, terabytes of data, and how we might even conceive of scaling systems that could grow to be much larger, and where the bottlenecks are going to be, kind of what are some of the problems that we're going to expect to run into as the size of the data grows. So those are just sort of some of the main concepts that I want us to keep in mind here uh, when we're talking about search overall.